God has put that music in our hearts, no matter what's going on around us, it is well with my soul. That's what we're going to sing next for you. Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church today, our live stream service. And I hope it is well with your soul this morning. If you know the Lord is your Savior, then all is well. Listen to the news, it's not so well. But listen to the Word of God this morning, and all can be well in your soul this morning. And I hope you can say that in a little bit. I hope that you know Christ is your Savior. And if you do, then all is well. Appreciate the good song this morning. Thank you for watching with us on live stream. And let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our service this morning. Please bow your heads. And let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Father, we are just grateful once again for this opportunity you've given us to be in the house of God today. And we thank you for those that are gathered together around, uh, around their computer screens, their TV screens, their phones this morning. 
And then those few of us who are here today to sing and preach to you, we thank you for all of those. And we, we thank you, Lord, for technology and the opportunity we had today to reach so many people by way of internet, by way of live stream. But thank you so much for that. Thank you for those that's been working uh, tirelessly all week to make all this possible. I pray you bless them in a special way. And then this morning, God, as we sing these songs, as we preach the Word of God this, this morning, we pray that you may bless all of that. And I pray you may speak to our hearts. I pray this morning, Lord, that the Word of God may, uh, Lord, may, may do what only you can do, and that's speak to our hearts, Lord. Change us from the inside out. Father, make us more like thee, and help us be the kind of Christian we're supposed to be in these days in which we live. I pray this in all things, in Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Darkness. 
thank you so much for that song. I can think of no song more fitting than that song right there. There's a better, a better day of coming. A, a day when we can have normal church services. A day we can go to the store normally and go to work and all these things. But more important is a better day coming where we're going to see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I hope you're looking forward to that day. But until then, we have many things to overcome. We're living in a time and and day in which there's many battles for the Christian to face, many things that are against us. But I'm glad this morning to realize and understand that we have the God of all gods upon, uh, with us. We have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit to help us in these days in which we live. And I hope this morning you'll enjoy the service. I hope God will speak to you as we look in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to begin reading in verse number 11. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 11. Our series is called, We Are Overcomers. We've been talking about several things going on in our life in which we need the Lord's help to overcome these things. If you remember several weeks ago, we talked about how David was able to overcome the giant with the Lord's help. And then a couple weeks ago, we talked about the shield of faith by which we can, uh, we can quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. We use uh, faith to overcome our fears. And I think it was last week we talked about having on those shoes of peace to overcome our anxieties. And this morning we're going to look at one more piece of equipment that the, the, the Lord gives you and I who are saved, and that is, that's the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Look please in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to look in verse number 11 and read down to the first part of verse 14. Actually, let's look in verse 10. We'll begin our reading right there. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And look in verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. I want to speak on that thought this morning, overcoming lies with the truth. Overcoming lies with the truth. Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, we pray for the next few moments. You may, you may bless Your Word to our hearts. I pray, God, You may use me as I speak these words to the people that are listening. I pray, God, You may allow these words to minister to our hearts and souls this morning. I pray these words would would draw us to Jesus Christ. I pray these words would make us better fit to serve the Lord in these days in which we live. And I pray especially, Lord, for someone who may be listening that does not know Christ as Savior, that today they'd call upon the Lord and be saved. Bless your people today. Bless your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I heard a story this past week. I read it, and it's about a newspaper that took place many, many years ago. matter of fact, the year was 1899. On June 24, 1899, it was a very slow news day in Denver, Colorado. Four reporters from four Denver newspapers were hanging about the Denver rail yard station hoping to catch sight of an incoming celebrity or hear some other gossip they could turn into a story for the Sunday edition of their paper. But no such luck. They all retreated to the Oxford Hotel to commiserate over their problem in the hotel bar. And then one of the reporters, Al Stevens, had a eureka moment. He would just invent a story and turn it in for publication as being factual. The other reporters sensed a possibility, but they also sensed it would be, have to be a foreign story that couldn't be very easily verified. And so they agreed. And here's the story. A group of American engineers stopped over in Denver last night en route to China to submit a bid on tearing down the Great Wall. Another reporter from the group asked, why would China want to tear down their most famous national monument? A few ideas and theories later, they all agreed. They were doing this as an act of international goodwill to signify new openness to the world and to invite new waves of foreign trade. According to their fake news story, the Great Wall would be replaced by a 1,500-mile highway into the very heartland of China. Brilliant! All four reporters wrote up their version of the story and submitted it to their respective newspapers. And so the news story was told, or a hoax masquerading as a news story was told. All four Denver papers printed this story, which reportedly made its way even to Europe and China, 
So people around the world believed the United States was sending an envoy to dismantle the Great Wall of China. People believe all kinds of lies. And people tell all kinds of lies. Our, our society, our, our, our world is filled with, with much lies. It's evident in every walk of life. And I think here's why it's so evident, and here's why it's so, it's so prevalent, is because our enemy, the devil, we know this, he's the father of lies. And we are tempted to both say lies and to believe lies. And if the devil can tempt us, then he will get us to believe him, and then he can wreck our entire life. You, you've all uh, heard the stories. Maybe you've even received uh, one of those phone calls or one of those email scams that you have a, a cousin who's a Nigerian prince. And if you and he's come along uh, with billions of dollars, and if you'll just uh, if you'll just give him your your bank account number, then he'll be so nice as to put most of that money in your bank account and just leave him a little bit. If you'll be so nice, he'll do that for you. That's just a lie. Hopefully, you've not fallen for that. We all have people that we work with who lie about the hours they work. We have folks lie to us and lie and say things to to get something from us. And, and we all know people who have gone through loopholes and told stories and lies to, for their advantage. Especially when it comes time to taxes. Many people will lie on their taxes to get more refund or pay less taxes. In, in their book, Freakonomics, Stephen D. Levitt and Stephen J. Dubner, they tell the story of an IRS officer named John Sluiggy. In the early 1980s, Sluiggy had completed enough random audits of other people's tax returns to know that many U.S. citizens were inflating the number of their dependents so they'd receive a bigger refund at the end of the year. And Sluiggy decided that something needed to be done. And his solution was to require taxpayers to list their children's Social Security numbers. Initially, there was a lot of resistance to the idea, said Sluiggy. The answer I got is that it would be much like the book 1984. A few years later, however, Saligi's idea was revisited and passed into law in 1986. When the following year's returns came trickling in, he and the rest of the IRS were astounded because over 7 million dependents had suddenly disappeared. So what that means is just that one example, that at least 7 million people lied on their tax returns. And so whether it's a white lie, or a blue lie, or a red lie, or a green lie, a lie is a lie is a lie. A lie for any reason is wrong, and our world is full of lies. And it's sad when you can't take somebody's word for things anymore. It's sad when a, a handshake no longer is adequate. It's sad when just, a, when just a promise is not kept. It's sad that our world is filled with so many lies. Well, how do we overcome those lies? I want to give you three things this morning. I hope it will be a help to you. If you have your outline out, write this down. Number one, notice the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Go back to verse 14, back in our text, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Look what the Bible says. Stand therefore, Paul says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So in Ephesians, this part of Ephesians 6, Paul is telling the, the Christian, he's saying this, that you, you must stand therefore against the wiles or the tricks or the deceit, the devices of the devil. You must stand therefore. And to me it's very interesting that when he tells us to stand, the very first piece of equipment mentioned specifically is the belt of truth. It's interesting because the belt really is not really even a weapon. The soldier's belt that's referred to here in verse 14 is it has a very important function. It's very vital to most of the soldiers' equipment. The soldiers, now go back, I don't know, 3,000 years ago or so, 2,000 years ago, when in your mind, think about the Roman soldiers, uh, think about his attire. He'd wear what's called a tunic. You say, what's a tunic? A tunic's like a long t-shirt. And the tunic would come down uh, about to the knees, and, and it would start at the shoulders and go down to the knees. And, and over this tunic, he would wear a metal vest type thing. And uh, from the bottom of this vest would be these leather straps that go all the way around just to protect him. And it'd go from about here to halfway down his thighs. He would wear this when he was fighting. And this belt 
was a band of thick, wide leather with loops in it and slots in it. And this belt, it clamped over the, uh, over the, the tunic and the, and the vest, and, and, it would, and it would hold all that stuff together. Without the belt, the soldier would not be very well prepared. Without the belt, the soldier could not fight the way he ought to fight. From this belt hung a sword, it, a, a rope, oftentimes a bag of rations, a money bag, and of course, the darts. Everything the soldier would need for his hand-to-hand -hand combat, he would find hanging on his belt. The belt held everything together. Without the belt, nothing else the soldier had would really be very successful. When the soldier had to run for either because he was losing or because he was winning, he would have to take that tunic in and tuck that tunic into his belt and so he could run fast. Imagine trying to run wearing a skirt. So he'd take that tunic, he would tuck it into that belt so he could, he could run. And so everything the soldier needed was right there on that belt. The sword, the, the rope, the bag of money, the bag of rations, all he needed was right there on his belt. Everything he would need as he faced his battles was right there on the belt. Here's what that means to me and you today. It means this, as a Christian, the truth of the Word of God is what holds everything in our life together. And the truth from the Word of God allows you and I to be prepared to face whatever we may face. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 says this, If so be that ye have heard Him, and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus. So when we have the truth, and when we know the truth, we can overcome the lies that our enemy feeds us. We can be well prepared in our battle. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, uh, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Both of these verses tell us uh, that the truth gives us courage to stand against our enemy. The truth. Somebody asked this question. Why is truth so important? Why is truth so important? The answer is very simple. And here's, what, here's the answer. Our enemy, the devil himself, is not only a liar, but the, the Bible tells us he's the father of lies. And so what that means is, every lie that's ever been told comes from the mind of Satan. And the only thing that can overcome uh, the lies of this devil is the truth from the Word of God. So the belt of truth we must have, if we're going to overcome the lies of this world, we must have on the belt of truth. Number two, notice this, write this down. The basics of truth. The basics of truth. Contrary to popular belief, there is an absolute truth. There is something, and we're going to see, there's something and someone who is always truth. Now, I must say that because we live in a world that says there is no absolute truth. We live in a world that says, you know, what's true today may not be true tomorrow. And what was true in the 50s and 60s, and, and what was true back in the Bible days is not true today. Well, that's just one of those lies from the devil. The truth is always the truth. If God said it, if the Bible records it, then it's always true. No matter what this world says to us, the truth is always the truth. The truth is always, is, is always absolute. The truth is always found in, and we'll look, we'll look at this, in the, the Bible and also in God the Father. There, there, it's always truth. 
In Jesus, in the Bible, in the Word of God, there is always truth. There's something that's true all day, every day, from the beginning of time till the end of time. And it's not found on the Internet. It's not found in the library. It's not on Wikipedia or even on Google. It's not in the mind of the world's great philosophers or the world's great theologians. It's only found in two places, first of all. It's found in the Bible. First of all, notice this. What is truth? What is truth? John 18, 38 says this. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find no fault in him at all. 2,000 years ago, a very, very important man named Pilate. Pilate was what's called the Roman governor. The, the governor was in charge of pretty much everything. And the governor, his particular job in this day is to investigate Jesus, to investigate his so-called crimes and to, and to pass judgment upon him and to find out if he's guilty or if he's innocent. You know the story, he was arrested for, being, for the, the claim that he was God. And they didn't like this, so they arrest him and they bring him before Pilate. And Pilate has to decide, is, is, is this man guilty of what they say he's done? Is this man Jesus, is he lying or is he telling the truth? And so after an investigation, after looking at the evidence, after listening to people's stories, he says this, well, what is truth? And with that being said, when he said this, what is truth? He looked at Christ and said this, in him I find no fault at all. In other words, Pilate, even Pilate, the Roman governor, he looked upon our Lord and said this, He is the truth. In Him there is no lie. And then he turned Jesus over to a crowd. And they crucified Him. R.C. Sproul said this, Pilate judged the truth. He sentenced the truth. He scourged the truth. He mocked the truth. He crucified the truth. The irony is that at the very moment he asked the question, what is truth, he was staring right at the truth. The one who is the truth had just said to him in the previous verse, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Pilate asked the question 2,000 years ago that's still being asked today. And here's the question, what is truth? And the answer is very simple. The truth is the Word of God. But all I am is a preacher. I'm no theologian. I'm no Bible scholar. So if you won't take my word for it, will you at least take the Lord's word for it? In John 17, 17, Jesus said this, Sanctify them through thy truth. And then here's what He said. Thy word is truth. Over in, over in other Scriptures, we could take time and look at all these Scriptures, and we'll do that in just a moment. We, we read and we understand, we realize that, that Jesus says, uh, that even Jesus said that the Word of God is truth. And truth is found in one place. It's found in the Bible. It's found in the place you and I can turn to every day of our life. It's a place we find in a place where folks have literally given their lives to. We find in a place where literally wars have been started and crusades have begun and ended all because of the Word of God. What is truth? Truth is the Bible. Number two, notice this. Who is truth? Who is truth? Hopefully you understand that the Word of God is truth, but let me take it a step further. We know the Word of God is truth, but we also understand that the, the God of the Word is truth. Uh, again, don't take my word for it. I'm just a man. I'm just a preacher. I'm no theologian. But uh, I do want to show you some things that the Bible says who is truth. In, in Deuteronomy 32.4, the Bible says this, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. In Psalm 31, verse 5, we read these words, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. 
Isaiah 65, 16 says these words, that he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. So the Bible tells us, this word that we know is the truth tells us, that first of all, God the Father is truth. And then it goes even further, and tells us that God the Holy Spirit is truth. You, you see, you can't separate God from the Holy Spirit or from the Son of God. They're all the same. So in John 15, 26, we read these words. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even, listen carefully, the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16, 13 says this, How be it, when he, listen carefully, the Spirit of truth is come. He will guide you in all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. Listen to 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 6. He, uh, this is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit, listen carefully, is truth. So... I said all that to say this. The truth is the Word of God. The truth is God the Father. The truth is God the Holy Spirit. The truth also is in the Son of God. Listen to John 14, 6. Oh, what a verse. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, listen, the truth, and the life, and no man come to the Father but by me. So the truth is this, it's, it's in the Word of God, it's in God the Father, it's in God the Spirit, it's in God the Son, all at the same time. The truth is not something that's obtuse or obsolete. It's not something that's unreachable or unknowable. It's not something too hard to hear or too hard to understand. The truth is very real. It's very solid. It's very tangible. It is in the Word of God, and in the God of the Word, the Father, the Son, and and the, the Holy Spirit. It's all the truth. That's the basics of truth. So we notice the belt of truth, first of all. We notice the, the basics of truth. And now, so what does all that mean? We know that we ought to have the truth, and we know what the truth is. So now, how do we, how do we obtain it? How do we use it if Paul told us to stand therefore, and then before that he said to take the whole armor of God that withstand the fire darts of the wicked one. And he told us earlier to, uh, above all, to stand. If he told us all these things, if, if he's reminded us that we're in a battle for the truth, and he's told us to put on our belt, and he's told us that the truth is the Bible, the, the, our, our Savior, the Holy Spirit, God the Father. So now what do we do? Number three, notice the battle for truth. The battle for truth. I sort of mentioned a little bit earlier this, but I, I need to say it again because we, we live in an age of relativism. We, we live in an age where so-and-so's opinion is the truth, and if you don't agree with him, then you're not the truth. Or over here, somebody over there, well, well, they really know the truth, and if you don't believe them, then you don't know the truth. And, and one group says this, and one group says this, and one church says this, and one church says this, and, and, and one political party says this, and, and one doctor says this, and, and one TV pr uh, announcer says this, and, and there's all these different kind of quote-unquote truths. And we understand, and we, I hope we don't know this by now, there's only one truth. And how do you and I as a Christian in this battle, how do we battle for the truth? God gives us what we need to overcome the lies. And first of all, we get that, first of all, number one, by seeking the truth. Seeking the truth. Remember that game when you were a kid? Hide and seek? It might be, I don't know, it might be too mean to play that anymore because, you know, if you're the one counting and hiding, and, and got to go look for people, you're it. You know, and it could be not good. So we can't play hide and seek anymore, probably. But when we were a kid, we could play hide and seek. But I'm glad today that we don't have to, that, that we don't have to worry about the truth 
hiding from us. I'm glad we don't have to count to 50 and then say, ready or not, here I come. I'm thankful that you and I, as a child of God, we have the truth always with us because we have God always with us. Look at these verses. Psalm 119, verse 2. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies and that seek Him with the whole heart. Psalms 119, 45 says this, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. So we, we understand that we're supposed to be seeking the truth. Very good, preacher. Thank you for that. But how do we do so? First of all, by studying the truth. If we're going to truly seek the truth, then we have to be committed to studying the Bible. Don't just take my word for it. You study your Bible to help you understand the truth. If we're going to, if we're going to seek the truth, we've got to understand that we must learn the doctrines of the Bible. And the more we know about the Bible, the more we know about God. And too often we're guilty, though, sadly, of being what they call Bible readers only. I mean, anybody can read their Bible. I mean, for crying out loud, if you can't read your Bible, probably you have on your phone an app that will read the Bible to you. How convenient. But it's more than just reading the Bible. We must be more than just readers of the Bible. We must be students of the Bible. Here's what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What's that mean? Paul says, Timothy, Timothy, if you're going to be able to hand, handle the battle and serve the Lord in those perilous times in which you're going to live, you must study the Bible. The more we know about the Bible, the less confusion there will be. The more we know about the Bible, the more we know about the truth, the less we'll be susceptible to the devil's lies. Christian author, his name is Stu Weber, he said this, he asked this question in one of his lectures. He asked this question, are you involved in a regular, rigorous regimen of Bible study? If not, what in the world are you doing? Your mind, your most crucial weapon in the battle, is braced by doctrine. Your soul is strengthened by Bible knowledge. You, you know... We could spend all day, every day, we could probably, I, I don't know if the, 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 the days or whatever, but we probably could sit in, I don't know, a, a couple of two, three days, we probably could read every word of our Bible from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to the book of the Revelation. We probably could sit down and just read it all and just read it all. And if we're not going to study, though, what we've read, it really is one of those things that goes in one ear and out the other. We must seek the truth by studying the truth. And second of all, and here's the hard part, submitting to the truth. Again, reading the Bible. Studying the Bible will do us no good if we're not going to submit to the Bible. If we're going to seek the Lord in such a way that we're going to overcome the lies of the devil, it'll be more than just studying. It'll also take submitting. We have to submit, listen carefully please, to who God is, not to who we want God to be. We have to submit to God so He'll change us and not change God so we can make it easier to submit to Him. So we must seek the truth, number one. Second of all, we must speak the truth. Speak the truth. I'm sure you've all heard of a man named John Wooden. If not, I am praying for you. Between 1963 and 1974, Coach John Wooden led the UCLA men's basketball team to, listen carefully, 10 national championships, including seven championships in a row between 1966 and 1972. Though he died in 2010, at the age 99, he remains a legend in his field. A basketball genius and a mentor and guide to his players, Wooden was more concerned about them learning how to live a good life than anything else. He said this, if they lived well, then they most likely would play well. 
Wooden's father-like coaching style seemed odd in the turbulent years during which he coached. Bill Walton, one of Wooden's players who went on to great success in the NBA, he said this about his coach. We thought he was nuts. But in all his preachings and his teachings, listen, everything he told us turned out to be true. Did you catch that? Here's Bill Walton, one of the NBA greats. I mean, he's kind of crazy now, but in his day, he was one of the great players of NBA history. And here's what he said about his coach. Everything our coach told us was the truth. Uh, again, we live in a day where people lie, lie, lie like a rug, and, and then they lie, and they lie, and they lie, and there's just lies everywhere. But aren't you going to know that you and I, we can overcome these lies by, by speaking the truth. Can I remind you for a moment that God hates lies? In God's sight, it's always right to speak the truth. And it's always wrong to speak a lie. Again, I'm just a preacher. I'm no theologian. I'm no Bible scholar. But I can read the Bible. And the Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through verse 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. So without being even a Bible scholar, I realize that the Bible's fixing to tell me what six things the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination unto Him. So again, He's going to tell us six things God hates and seven which are an abomination to Him. In other words, they make God sick. And here's the list. A proud look. Look at this next one. A lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Listen to this a false witness that speaketh lies in this list of seven things, two of them are lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. Listen to Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. And listen to Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16. These are the things that ye shall do. So again, Zechariah is going to tell us what we ought to do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath, for all these things I I hate, saith the Lord. Again, can I tell you that God hates, they make Him sick when lies are told. So how do we speak the truth? First of all, we speak the truth boldly. Boldly. We live in a society that we're afraid to hurt somebody's feeling. And we're afraid if we say the wrong thing that we might upset somebody. And we're afraid if we say something that may be a little bit negative, that we may scar their feelings and they'll be hurt forever and forever. And we're afraid that we can't really be honest and really be truthful because we, we, may, we, we may turn somebody away. How nonsense is that? Part of the prescription for overcoming the lies is to boldly speak the truth i never forget, it was 1988, 32 years ago. I was a sophomore in high school. Goodness gracious. And I can remember that coming up through like rec league and junior high and middle school, I kind of began to get for myself a, a reputation of being a good baseball player. And so when I got to 10th grade, I mean, I got to be on the varsity. I mean, I was Mr. I was Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Baseball. I was, you know, going to turn this thing around. And, and this team was glad to have me on their, te- on their team. And, and they'd heard about me. They knew about me. And they said things like this. We're so glad you're on our team because we want you in our lineup. We want you on our team. And my head began to get, you know, kind of big. I mean, wasn't yours. If everybody wanted you on their team, even the seniors wanted you on their team, you begin to get the big head. And with this big head came me getting a little bit lazy. So my coach, and we'll forget this conversation, he came to me and he said something like this. He says, Matt, or Matty G was my nickname. He said, uh, you, know, you, you know how good you are at baseball, right? I said, yes. And he says, you know how good they think you are at baseball. So I said, yes. 
And coach said this, he says, he says, Matt, if you're not careful, you're going to get the big head and you're going to get lazy. And if you have the big head and if you're lazy, you'll not make it in baseball. My coach, whom I respect to this day still, was bold enough to tell me the truth. He didn't worry about my feelings, didn't worry about uh, scarring my emotions, didn't worry about me becoming, uh, going loony and going crazy. He didn't worry about how I felt about it. He loved me enough to boldly tell me the truth. And I appreciate it. It hurt my feelings at first a little bit. And I realized he loved me. And from that day forward, I was always the first one to practice, the last one to leave practice, never missed practice, and worked harder than anybody else, and I guess I sort of made it okay. Here's my point. If we're going to speak the truth, we must speak the truth, first of all, boldly. Do not be afraid to stand for truth. Do not be afraid to speak the truth because I can tell you one thing, those who are against us, they're not one bit afraid to speak their nonsense. Speak the truth boldly. And second of all, speak the truth lovingly. Lovingly. We've got to remember to keep not a spirit of meanness, but a spirit of love. Ephesians 4.15 is very plain. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto Him all things which is in the head, even Christ. So you know as a, as a child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and because we have studied and we have read and we have learned the truth through the Word of God, you and I in the sinful world where there's lies abounding, you and I, we can both speak the truth boldly, we can also speak the truth lovingly. The story is told about a fourth grade teacher who was recovering from surgery. And she received a get well card from her class, and the card said this, Dear Miss Fisher, your fourth grade class wishes you a speedy recovery by a vote of 15 to 14. <laughs> so they told her the truth, but maybe not so much lovingly. We're to speak the truth, we're to do so with a spirit of love. Number three, and we'll be done. We seek the truth. In this battle, we seek the truth. And we do so by speaking the truth. And finally, we do so by living the truth. Living the truth. Our goal as a child of God should always be to be more like Christ every day. And we know many things about Him. And one thing we do know about Him is just what Pilate, just what Pilate saw in Him. In Him, is, is, there's no lies. There's, there's nothing in Him that's gone amiss. He's, he's always been truthful. He's always been faithful. And this Jesus whom you guys are going to crucify, in Him I find no fault. He did everything correctly. And might you and I learn to live the truth like Christ lived the truth. In John 8, 46, we read uh, these words. Jesus says this, "...which of you convinceth me of sin?" In other words, Jesus asked those following Him, somebody tell me what I've done wrong. And if we took time to read the rest of the story, we'd, we'd, we'd find out, we'd read that, that nobody said anything. Nobody accused Him of anything. Why is that? Because He did nothing wrong. When Christ, imagine in the book of Mark, imagine while Christ is hanging on the cross of Calvary, that even that centurion, when Christ had given His life for the souls of mankind, this centurion, this Roman soldier, he said this, he says, truly, this man is the Son of God. And even the thief who hung next to Christ said this in Luke 23, 41. Speaking of Jesus, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Pilate, the centurion, and, and now even the, the, the thief on the cross who hung next to the Lord, they all realize something, that this one Christ, this one Jesus, this one Messiah, this one Son of God, in Him is nothing but the truth. And so we can live the truth. We can be like Christ. Second or third John chapter 
4 says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children do what? Walk in truth. Now as a parent, surely your desire for your children and for your grandchildren is that they walk in truth. Surely, if you have brought kids into this world, or if you work in children's church or on, on a bus route, or you work in some kind of children's ministry, surely your desire for them is that they learn in their life to, to walk in truth. Surely that's true about you. Surely you want your kids to one day walk in truth. Surely. Don't you think that God our Father wants the same for His children? That they walk in truth? And the verse tells us that there's no greater joy than our children walk in truth. Your children, your grandchildren, walking in truth should bring you more joy than if you get a hundred stimulus checks. Your children, the desire or the, the, the fruition of your children walking in the truth ought to bring you more joy, ought to bring you more happiness, ought to make you a more satisfied child of God than anything else in this world would ever do. The Bible says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And Christ's desire for you and I is the same exact thing. How do we do so? And we're done. First of all, through confession. <clears throat> Psalms 51, 6 is part of David's prayer, repentance. And here's what he said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thy, thou soul shalt make me to know wisdom. If we truly want to, to live a life in truth, then we have to make sure that when we are wrong, uh, we must uh, make things right. <laughs> That's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to admit when you're wrong. It's hard in our prideful, hard hearts to admit, I'm wrong. And we realize we're wrong, we must confess. James 5.16 says this, Confess your faults one to another. If I've done you wrong, or you've done me wrong, we must confess those things one to another, and also confess those things to God. We, we live in truth by confession, and finally we live in truth through correction. When we do wrong, and we confess our wrong, we make things right, we've not lived in the truth, listen please, until we've made a change. <clears throat> I like how David prayed in Psalm 139. He said, he said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Here's what David is saying. And we're, we're almost done. We're almost done. Here's what David is saying. He's saying, Lord, <clears throat> I know I've been wrong. I have, I have committed adultery. I've committed murder. I'm prideful. Lord, I've turned my back on You, and I've done some things that are just wrong. Lord, I've lied. I've done all these things, Lord. And here's what David says, Lord, but I want you to search my heart and know my thoughts. And if there be any wicked way in me, here's what he's saying. He's saying, cleanse me of those things and help me to do better. If we're going to confess our faults to one another and to God, and if we don't allow this confession to change us, then we've not lived in the truth. We're continuing to live in that lie. And if we're going to overcome the lies of this world, we have to make sure that we make things right with the Lord because He and His Word are the only sources of truth. One more verse and we're going to be done. John eight thirty two. And ye shall know the what? Truth. And the truth shall make you free. Our world, the devil, has filled many people's minds with lies. Lies like this, just for instance. You know if, this is the devil speaking, you know if there really is a heaven, then there's really no way to know how to get there. 
And then, you know, if there is a way to get there, then the devil's still speaking here. He says, well, you know, if you'll just, uh, if you'll just get baptized, uh, then you can go to heaven. Or the devil's still speaking. He'll say things like this to you. You know, uh, if you would just, uh, as a, as a, if you are a sinner, then if you would just, you know, if you would just give some money, or if you would buy a certain kind of trinket, or if you would do a bunch of good deeds, and if you would just do your best to be a sincere person, then surely God, if there is a God from heaven, if there is a heaven, would look upon you and say, well, you've tried your best. You've done good enough. You, today, because I am in a good mood, then... You can go to heaven today. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You can know of heaven. You can know how to get there. And all that's found in John 14, verse 6, in Jesus, because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no woman, no boy, no girl goes to the Father except by Him. That's the truth. That's the truth. You can know the Lord is your Savior today. You don't need to keep a list of do's and don'ts. You don't need to be baptized to be saved. You don't need to join a church. You don't need to give money. You don't need to do this or that or pray a prayer. You must, the Bible says, we must call upon the name of the Lord and we shall be saved. That's the truth. That's the truth. Only through Christ can we overcome the lies of this world. Can we bow our heads please this morning? I want to ask you a question. Do you know the truth? His name is Jesus. And He's told us in His Word over and over and over again that His Word is truth. God the Father is the truth. God the Holy Spirit is the truth. And He is truth. God is the truth. Do you know Him? Have you, at uh, some point in your life, have you... Realize that you are a sinner and that because you're a sinner, you deserve to go to hell and pay for your sins. But do you also realize that you can't save yourself? But do you also understand that Christ went to the cross of Calvary and died in your place? He shed blood to cleanse you from your sin. And by faith today, in 2020, by faith you can receive Christ to be your Savior. You can call upon Him and thou shalt be saved. That's the truth. That's the truth. Can we pray together? Father, I want to thank You, Lord, for this time we've had together in Your Word. Lord, we want to thank You for...